Good afternoon, good morning, hello, wherever you are. Hello, good. It's my pleasure to introduce two speakers today uh, at our third SICE Immunopedia webinar on COVID-19. Our first speaker is Professor Christine Stabel. Uh, she is Professor in Global Health at the University of Southern Denmark and has worked at the Bandem Health Project in Guinea-Bissau since 1993. Dr. Ben's research focuses on how vaccines and vitamins affect the immune system and overall health in general ways other than what was previously thought. And I think she's going to introduce some new paradigms to us. Dr. Ben has performed epidemiological studies of health interventions and their effect on overall health in real life. She's an author of 278 scientific articles uh, for peer-reviewed journals and has supervised over 25 PhD students and over 40 master's students. Uh, and so it's my great pleasure, Dr. Ben, to introduce you to our webinar today. Thank you very much, Clive, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's nice to be here with you, even though it's in cyberspace. Uh, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share my work with you and uh, particularly to discuss with you uh, a question that I'm also asking myself, whether BCG for COVID-19 is uh, something we should have hopes for or if it's all just hype. It's almost 100 years ago that the first dose of BCG was administered uh, to babies and the uh, one of the inventors, Calmet, he actually noted very quickly on that there was something strange going on. Uh, mortality at that time among TB exposed children in uh, France was extremely high. Uh, they had a mortality of at least 16% and often over 25%. But Calmet noted that among the children who had been TB exposed but also BCG vaccinated, mortality was as low as 4.6%. So that made him ask himself the question whether the harboring of BCG confer on the organism some special aptitude to resist other infections. Unfortunately, Kalmel met he died uh, quickly after, and this question wasn't pursued for many decades before we started doing so in Guinea-Bissau in West Africa. We have a field station there, and uh, we follow more than 100,000 people with regular home visits. We register all vaccines, infections, hospitalizations, and vital status, and that permits us to do what nobody else had really done before, namely to study what is the overall health effect of receiving a vaccine. So it's a surprise to most people, but actually none of the currently used vaccines were ever tested for their effects on overall mortality and morbidity before they were being introduced because everybody was so certain that the vaccines only affected the target disease, not other diseases. So it didn't really seem worthwhile to do these studies of vaccines on overall health. But when we started doing so, some surprising results emerged. Um, and here are the results for BCG vaccine. This is a study done in the rural areas and a hallmark study for us published in 2000. We, uh, we gave vaccines, our teams gave vaccines to kids when they were visiting the villages and came back six months later and registered what has happened. And, uh, and you can see here that the mortality among the BCG vaccinated children uh, was only around, or only in quotation marks, around 2.5% compared with the almost 5% um, uh, in the non-vaccinated kids and in a survival analysis this amounts to a reduction in mortality among BCG vaccinated children versus non-vaccinated children. And this finding was just one of numerous observational studies done by us in Guinea-Bissau but also in other African countries and in Asia showing uh, uniformly that BCG is associated with much larger reductions in all cause mortality than explained by TB prevention because even though TB is a killer it doesn't kill 45% of all kids. But of course, these observational studies are prone to biases because uh, particularly one bias is important here, and that is that all over the world, parents are hesitant to vaccinate their little kids. Um, so, so there is uh, what we call healthy vaccine bias in these uh, studies, uh, an inherent bias in favor of any vaccine when you compare vaccinated versus unvaccinated kids. And though it's difficult to imagine that that should be as much as a uh, halving of the reduction in mortality or cause a halving of mortality, then it was extremely important that we were also able to do randomized trials. 
we took advantage of the fact that children with low birth weight at the time when we did the trials were recommended to get a delayed BCG vaccine. Um, so we could randomize kids with a low birth weight to receive BCG at birth or the usual delayed BCG vaccine. And then we could compare in an unbiased fashion what happened in terms of mortality in the neonatal period before the control group received, B, uh, received BCG vaccine. And we did three trials under three different mortality settings, and you can see that the results were uniformly positive. And in a combined analysis of the three trials, BCG was associated with a 38% reduction in neonatal mortality. And this was obviously uh, not at all uh, related to its effect on tuberculosis, because tuberculosis generally doesn't kill neonates. And we could show that this effect was driven by reductions in septicemia and respiratory infections. So really showing here that BCG vaccine has effects on other diseases than the target disease. It has what we call beneficial non-specific effects, inc increasing the resistance towards a, a broad range of other infections. WHO reviewed the evidence for non-specific effects of BCG vaccine in 2016 and concluded that receipt of BCG and, uh, could reduce overall mortality more than expected through the effect on tuberculosis. And uh, in a meta-analysis of the five randomized trials and the nine observational studies, including in this, in this, meta, uh, this review, uh, BCG was indeed associated with this uh, almost a halving of child mortality. It's important also to mention from the epidemiological studies that the the effect of BCG revaccination may be even more pronounced. In 2016, we reviewed the evidence regarding BCG vaccination and all-cause mortality in children, and we found two randomized trials, one from uh, Algeria in the 50s and one we did ourselves in Guinea-Bissau in the uh, zeros, and both showed beneficial effect of BCG revaccination on all-cause mortality in children. Um, Moving to slightly older populations in South Africa, you recently did a trial of a new tuberculosis vaccine and very applaudable, the researchers included a BCG revaccination arm in that trial and they also looked at other non-TB outcomes and they could report that the rate of upper respiratory tract infections was lower in the BCG revaccinated group. And moving on to the elderly, in Indonesia, they did a trial, a small trial, with monthly BCG for uh, three months uh, consecutively and showed also here significant reductions in the prevalence of upper respiratory tract infections. So all available evidence that I've been able to find on BCG revaccination uh, shows quite uniformly that the effect of receiving several BCG vaccines is even better than just receiving one BCG vaccine. How can a vaccine against tuberculosis be associated with great reductions in all-cause mortality due to non-specific beneficial effects on other infections? Well, that's of course a question we need to address and there we are super grateful for the help that we got not least from the Dutch group led by Mihaina Thea at Radboud University. In a hallmark paper in 2012 here, they published a, a very nice experiment where they took Dutch volunteers, bled them, gave them BCG and bled them again two weeks and three months later. And as you can see here, uh, this increased their cytokine responses, not only as you would anticipate to mycobacterium tuberculosis, but also to non-related pathogens like Staph aureus and Candida albicans. And they could show very neatly that this was due to BCG inducing methylation at the promoter genes for pro-inflammatory cytokines in the monocytes. And within this same paper, they also showed that in skid mice, BCG vaccination uh, protected against an otherwise lethal candida infection, uh, really supporting that BCG vaccine induces what they have coined innate immune training, uh, and that correlates with better outcomes of unrelated um, infections. We repeated these findings also in Guinean babies. We could show that in some of the babies included in the trials I showed you before, randomized to BCG or no BCG, by four weeks of age, those randomized to BCG had more uh, or increased cytokine responses to a number of unrelated uh, stimuli. And recently, we also uh, repeated this in adults uh, over 50 years of age in Guinea-Bissau. We randomized them to BCG or saline, and uh, we looked at their cytokine responses two weeks and two months after. Uh, yellow color here indicates lower responses in BCG vaccinated than unvaccinated, blue color higher responses, and you'll see by two months uh, most cytokine responses were higher in the BCG, uh, BCG vaccinated group. And interestingly, when we zoomed in on the quantiferin positive participants, you'll see that a lot of the cytokine responses almost uniformly are increased, uh, suggesting and supporting that uh, BCG uh, boosting here, uh, boosting of a naturally occurring uh, mycobacterium uh, infection is associated with stronger responses to BCG vaccine.
One study I particularly want to emphasize, uh, which we did in collaboration with, with Matthias' group, uh, is this experiment where we took Dutch volunteers and gave them BCG or no BCG, and then four weeks down the line, we gave them a yellow fever vaccine, and we measured viremia in the blood type five days later. And we could show that those who had received BCG prior to yellow fever vaccine had less virus in the blood, and this was correlated with BCG uh, inducing epigenetic modifications of the monocytes, leading not least to more IL-1 beta production. Uh, so this is really, uh, to me, an extremely important proof of principle that this bacterial vaccine can induce uh, and, and, and affect the course of a subsequent completely unrelated viral infection. So to summarize what I told you now about BCG, what we know about it from the epidemiological and immunological studies, there are numerous epidemiological studies now showing beneficial nonspecific effects on other infections in children. They haven't all been uniformly positive, and we have identified several potential effect modifiers, uh, not least BCG strain, which is known to be extremely important for TB protection, uh, where BCG uh, from, from Denmark and BCG of Japan have stronger effects than BCG Russia. This also seems to be the case when we talk about the nonspecific effects. Generally, females have more benefit from BCG, and children whose mother received BCG also seem to benefit more from BCG. There is, uh, most of the studies have been done in kids, uh, obviously, since this is a childhood vaccine, but based on the evidence we have from adults and elderly, BCG does seem to have the similar beneficial nonspecific effects in these age groups. Uh, it's notable that many of the effects were particularly strong in respiratory infections, and also that they're amplified or seem to be amplified based on the available evidence by BCG revaccination. And we have several potential immunological mechanisms now which can explain these findings. I told you about the innate immune training, but we also, also recently published that BCG decreases systemic inflammation, uh, which could help explain some of the beneficial findings. And also we recently published that it induces emergency granulopoiesis in the newborn, uh, counteracting the normal decline in neutrophils. And this emergency granulopoiesis could really potentially help explain why BCG should have such pronounced and, and rapidly occurring effects on child or neonatal septicemia. And finally, there's just a paper published one of these last days suggested epitope homo homology between uh, BCG and uh, actually SARS coronavirus too. Uh, so all these mechanisms could contribute to BCG's nonspecific effects. And, and obviously all this epidemiological and immunological evidence begs the question whether BCG vaccine could have some impact on SARS coronavirus too. And this is the second part of my talk here. Coincidentally, <laughs> when SARS coronavirus emerged, we were hosting the world's first conference on nonspecific effects in Cambridge. Um, you can see here the dates in February 2020. So uh, uh, many researchers gathered there interested in nonspecific effects of vaccines, obviously is discussed uh, at length whether BCG and some of the other live attenuated vaccines with beneficial nonspecific effects could help mitigate the impact of the pandemic. And uh, many of the People present here, uh, Mihai Netia, Nigel Curtis, Camille Locke, went home immediately after and initiated BCG trials in their own countries. And we also initiated a trial in Denmark uh, where we are uh, vaccinating healthcare workers or randomizing them to BCG or no BCG. And uh, even this month, we'll be starting a new trial of BCG uh, to elderly to protect them against COVID-19 uh, in Denmark. And uh, later um, this month, a trial of BCG to healthcare workers in Guinea-Bissau, in Mozambique, and in Cape Verde. So, uh, I mean, this is a, a dreadful pandemic, but it's also heaven for somebody who is working on nonspecific effects and eager to see if it could make a difference. But even at the conference where we were all gathered, none of us, I think, had anticipated how much interest this hypothesis would uh, create. And uh, just today, there were 102 papers on PubMed, and there was even two more than yesterday, uh, on uh, the issues related to BCG vaccine and COVID. Most of them are without any data, so they're just speculative um, so far. But it's important to emphasize that they deal with two different hypotheses, which are often confused. Hypothesis one is about BCG at birth protecting against COVID-19, and the second hypothesis is about recent BCG protecting against COVID-19. And I'll take you through both hypotheses and the uh, data we have on them. So regarding hypothesis one, it was really built on ecological studies. The first, I think, was by Miller et al., showing correlation between countries' child BCG vaccination policy and COVID-19 mortality. 
Uh, these studies have been heavily criticized uh, by many people, including myself, because they are prone to a lot of bias, not least the fact that the countries that have a BCG child vaccination program often also are the countries which have uh, uh, poor capabilities for testing against COVID-19 and also rather poor mortality data. And this would create a false association between BCG vaccination policy and lower COVID-19 mortality. But some of the later ecological studies have actually done a lot to deal with these potential biases and not least the study by Escobar et al, which was published recently, it does a great job in trying to, to disentangle uh, the effect of various factors which differ between countries and still find a very strong correlation between childhood vaccination programs and subsequent mortality. Uh, it should be noted though that there have been done some natural experiments in countries which experienced the phase out of BCG and compared rather comparable and age-wise comparable groups of some people who just managed to get BCG before the program was stopped and some who were born just after and didn't get it. These studies, to my knowledge, was, were done at least in Israel and in Sweden and Germany, and uh, they show no effect, no difference in COVID between those who just managed to get BCG and those who didn't get BCG. Uh, but notably also these studies are generally in middle-aged people because the programs were phased out in the 70s and 80s. So this is not really the age group of, of severe COVID-19. It's a long stretch even for somebody who believes in non-specific effects of vaccines like myself to actually also believe that BCG could have such a long-term impact on mortality that a vaccine given at birth could impact mortality even decades, many decades later. But actually there is some supportive epidemiological data because we showed ourselves that in Denmark, BCG at school age was associated with lower mortality up to 45 years of age. And this was as long as we were able to follow participants. So potentially this could be even longer lasting. And for the biological possibility, we just published that BCG actually enters the bone marrow and programs the uh, hematopoietic progenesis uh, stem cells. Uh, so, so this could actually be a mechanism whereby BCG could have a very long-term imprinting effect on the immune system. Regarding hypothesis two, this is really what we discussed, discussed mostly in Cambridge, uh, the idea that BCG or other vaccines could provide some partial protection uh, until we have a specific vaccine against COVID. And uh, I think up to now I've stopped uh, counting, at least 15 trials are ongoing and more than 20,000 participants are planned to be enrolled. Most of them are in healthcare workers, uh, but some are also in elderly. And very interestingly, some of them in, are in countries with, with no prior BCG program, some in countries with previous programs, and, and the, some like the one I think we're going to hear about in the second part of this uh, webinar in, in, in countries which have an ongoing BCG vaccination program. While we are waiting for the results of these trials, and they haven't come out yet, there are no further trials to, to report from. Uh, to my knowledge, these two studies have been published which directly address on the individual level the link between recent BCG vaccination and subsequent uh, COVID uh, morbidity and mortality. Uh, one of them we took part in, and that was a follow-up of the Dutch vaccinated cohorts and comparable unvaccinated cohorts. Right in the beginning of the pandemic, we did a digital survey after the first few months and asked about uh, sickness and symptoms during the pandemic. And what you can see here in this recently published paper on the left-hand side is that those who received BCG reported significantly less sickness and, and significantly less fatigue. In another very recently published preprint, uh, the Emirates in a hospital offered the staff to get a BCG revaccination or no BCG revaccination. Uh, 71 staff members accepted BCG revaccination and had zero cases of COVID versus 18 cases among 209 uh, staff members who refused BCG revaccination. These studies are observational and obviously prone to biases and, and particularly the Emirates study didn't report any, any information on the differences between the vaccinated and unvaccinated cohorts. So they should not be seen as an argument or, or confirming in any way that BCG protects against COVID-19. But I think it's quite reassuring for us conducting the trials right now that um, any indication that BCG could be harmful. And indeed it has been proposed that if you enhance the innate immune response that could contribute to worsening the cytokine storm that's characteristic, characteristic of severe COVID, then, then uh, you know, it, it could be dangerous, but, but reassuringly, no indication here that recent BGT could worsen COVID-19.
So to sum up what I've told you here uh, and give you my take on it, I think there's very weak data and mostly ecological data on BCG at birth and COVID, uh, but some support from the previous studies, uh, circumstantial support for, for long-term non-specific effects of BCG. So the jury is still out in my opinion, and we desperately need some better studies to really be able to answer that question. Regarding hypothesis two, there's strong evidence from previous epidemiological and immunological studies for recent BCG to protect against non-related uh, infections, but obviously we are waiting for the results of the trials, which will hopefully be able to give us some very good answers. I'm very enthusiastic about them and also very uh, eager to uh, address some questions in relation to the trials, namely whether there's a difference in the effect between the first BCG and the booster BCG. Uh, I'm very glad that some of the trials include non-COVID-19 infections outcomes because obviously uh, this is a great opportunity to study the potential for non-specific effects of BCG also on other infections in adults and also to get closer to uh, finding out whether there is important effect modification by strain sex etc etc. I just want to say one thing and that is that it's uh, um, um, irrespective of the request for BCG, whether the trials request BCG, whether the results actually beg that we start BCG vaccinating adults, I don't think there's any justification for stopping giving BCG to babies. We need to ensure that there's enough BCG for the babies due to these very strong effects shown in them. So just a few last words on the perspectives. I, uh, uh, as I hinted, there are other live attenuated vaccines that also have beneficial non-specific effects. That's measles vaccine and MMR or polio vaccine. And, and we really uh, recently proposed that all these vaccines have the potential to act as stopgap vaccines for COVID-19 and future pandemics. Uh, I'm particularly interested in potentially studying uh, the interactions between these vaccines, which may very well work through different mechanisms, and there might well be synergies of giving not just one, but several of these vaccines at the same time. So if you become interested in reading more about non-specific effects of vaccines, uh, then I'd like to direct you in the, uh, or guide you in the direction of our recent review uh, published just a few months ago, where we asked the question whether it's time to change the paradigm in vaccinology, whether we should actually stop looking at vaccines as a means to uh, just protect against single diseases and more as a means to strengthen host immunity. So with that, I want to thank you all very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take any question you may have. Great, thank you very much, uh, Christine. Uh, there's a, a number of questions that have come through on the Q&A. Uh, the first one is, uh, what is the exact protocol for revaccination re in adults? Is it three doses over three months or what? what can, you, can you tell us? Nobody knows, and the studies dif did different things. Uh, so the, the South African study just gave one BCG revaccination, and in, in Indonesia it was some co consecutive BCG vaccinations. Uh, I think most of the trials that are being done now in countries which had prior BCG vaccination programs or have ongoing programs, they will also just be given a sec giving a, a second dose. But potentially, I mean, I, I'm... I'm a, I would be happy to speculate, I have no data on it, but, but that even more doses might be even more beneficial. At least we see for all polio vaccine and babies that uh, each additional dose of all polio vaccine to a child reduces its uh, risk of dying by another 13%, supporting that there are added values of continued boosting. Great. Um, so an, an, another question has come through is, um, uh, Obviously, in places like Guinea-Bissau and here in South Africa and, and all parts of Africa, really, there's lots of natural exposure to TB bacteria and to, obviously to TB antigens. Um, what role do you think natural exposure plays in the immune training against COVID-19? I think it plays a role and it's a very good question. Um, I, I think uh, the data from Guinea-Bissau, it's a, a small data, a small experiment, but it does support that natural infection has uh, primed you to a better response to, to BCG. And I think it's intriguing that if you look at uh, children and HIV positive, there's no doubt that you should uh, definitely treat uh, people with latent TB, but actually the results suggest that I've seen that if you treat healthy adults uh, for latent TB, it's actually associated with a tendency for harm. And that could indicate to me that it might be beneficial for your general immune system to harbor uh, TB as long as it's obviously not <laughs> becoming active. 
Right, and, and do, you, do you think, uh, another question is, do you think that BCG vaccination might be end up being superior to, to those that are specifically developed to COVID-19? Ooh, <laughs> that's a long stretch. I think most people would say I was exaggerating if I said so. I, I, I don't think at any point that PCG will be fully protective against COVID-19. But I, if you are pessimistic about a COVID-19 vaccine, it might not be either. It might be like a flu vaccine partially protecting uh, something you need to have every year and so on. Uh, it might end up being, depending on how poor a COVID vaccine we get, it might end up being a better deal to get a BCG vaccine. Right. Uh, I guess that's, that's an unknown question, but maybe uh, uh, another question which, which is quite important to think about is you've told us very nicely that BCG uh, vaccination um, potentiates kind of a, a good uh, environment for, for boosting immunity. But would that BCG vaccination also prime um, or predispose, predispose a cytokine storm and along comes um, SARS-CoV-2 and actually you make the individual worse in terms of pathogenesis? As I mentioned, and I might not have explained it sufficiently clearly, then it was a concern and, and maybe still is a concern that if you enhance the innate immune response, you could actually contribute to the cytokine storm. But I think it's, it's quite reassuring to see that uh, the, the data so far suggests the opposite uh, from the two preliminary studies done. And also, I think it's very important to say that there is a difference on giving BCG prior to getting infected and getting BCG while you are infected. Um, and, and I also want to emphasize a third point, and that is that we have seen that BCG reduces systemic inflammation um, so in, in the steady state. So I, I think all these uh, pieces of evidence uh, together point towards this not being uh, as severe or a sincere concern. So, so uh, I know there have been some studies uh, specifically here in Cape Town where BCG has been used as a vector. Uh, specifically for HIV, but do you think that BCG could kind of kill two birds with one stone by being a vector and a vaccine uh, and a potentiator of, of um, um, immunity? Yes, I think that's a good suggestion. And, and what you, you, you also gave some evidence or some hypothesis that there's some shared epitopes between BCG and SARS-CoV-2. What what are where are those shared epitopes and what do you think that a potential mechanism could be because uh, if you talk about epitopes you're talking about specific T cell immunity, of course. Yeah, so I'm talking about cross-reactive T cells, yes, and I don't mm. know much about the homology. The paper I can guide you now, is, it's one of the two papers that came since yesterday, I think, on PubMed on BCG and COVID. So you can find it there. Uh, it's published. It's not my main area, so I haven't really read it in detail. Uh, so so any, I'll, I'll, I'll direct the, the questioner to that paper for, for further <laughs> answers. Okay, great. Uh, another question is, is there a link uh, between BCG to Freund's adjuvant? Yes, uh, it is. Uh, Freund's adjuvant is a killed BCG, uh, BCG, isn't it? I'm not, I'm not particularly sure. Yeah, it is related to, to Freund's adjuvant. Right. And, and uh, not necessarily an immunological question, but um, an ethical one, which is, um, you, I think you mentioned at the very beginning of your talk about delayed uh, BCG vaccination. Um, what, what are the ethics involved in delaying such a BCG vaccination when we know it might be protected? Yeah, so, so the trial, as, as I mentioned, the trial, I'm glad for, for that uh, possibility to clarify. When we did the trial, it was policy to delay BCG. So what we did was uh, actually giving it earlier. Um, we gave it at birth, even though kids would normally have received it at six weeks. I think the other way around would have been problematic, and not least given what we know now uh, to, to delay BCG vaccine in babies who would otherwise have gotten it at birth. Uh, that, would, that would pose some more... Uh, ethical uh, questions than, than the way we did it. I should say that based on the results that we had of our trials, Guinea-Bissau has now changed its policy to give BCG at birth to all kids irrespective of birth weight. Great, and the, the last question that I can see in the Q&A is, uh, will there be any bad effect of oral, oral polio vaccine uh, 
was given to an individual infected with SARS-CoV-2 in the pre-symptomatic period? So I guess if, this is not a BCG specific question, but it's... Uh, if there would be any... Uh, I'd, 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 I didn't get the word. Um, uh, will, will there be uh, any detrimental effects if oral polio vaccine was given uh, in the pre-symptomatic period of a SARS-CoV-2 infection? I wouldn't think so, based on all I know. I, uh, what we have seen are very strong beneficial and specific effects of oral polio vaccine given in campaigns to kids, which, uh, I mean, obviously were kids of which many of them might have had ongoing or uh, initiating infections. It wasn't obviously SARS coronavirus, so I can't answer for that one. But based on, on everything we have seen, it's not detrimental. On the contrary, it seems to, to strengthen uh, overall health outcomes or bene be beneficial for overall health outcomes uh, given to a population where, where there will uh, inevitably have been many children with ongoing infections. Okay, well, with great thanks. Thank you very much, Christine, for your Thank you for the invitation uh, and thank you for, for great questions. And do not hesitate to write me or come back to me in any way if you have more questions to my presentation. Not you, Clive, but the audience. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> also you. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank so you. now it's, it's my great pleasure to introduce our second speaker um, for the webinar, and that's Professor Gerhard Walzer from Stellenbosch University. Uh, uh, Gerhard is a clinician scientist and is the head of the Division of the Molecular Biology and Human Genetics, and also heads up a, a large immunology research group. Uh, clinically, he's trained in the fields of pulmonology and intensive care medicine. And his research focuses on the immunology of mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, and in particular, host biomarkers including diagnostic markers, markers of TB treatment response, and markers of protective immunity to MTE. Um, the research group under his leadership conducts uh, large cohort studies uh, and trials, as well as characterizing MTB infection and disease phenotypes uh, in the South African and African context. So um, without further ado, Gerhard, the floor is yours and we look forward to your talk. Thank you, Clive. I'm trying to share my screen. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. And uh, the first part of the talk, I'm going to try to convince you that it was a good idea to do a BCG trial for COVID-19 in South Africa. Um, so let me start off with um, the current state of COVID in the world. Now, it is surprising and a big relief that Africa, apart from South Africa, has actually not followed the same trend as some of our more well-off um, countries in, in the North or the US or um, in South America. And I wonder actually, if uh, what Christine just said about um, the priming of um, natural tuberculosis exposure without disease might ac actually have something to do with this. Now, when we started thinking about this trial in uh, March, April, we of course had no idea what TB uh, co-infection with COVID would do. There were some uh, scary reports from China um, that people with latent TB actually progressed to active TB if, when they got COVID and that they would have more severe forms of COVID disease. These have not really been well peer reviewed, but we were certainly very worried at that stage that Africa and South Africa would suffer badly from severe COVID disease um, due to its HIV and tuberculosis uh, prevalence and uh, also a high prevalence of type 2 diabetes. So <clears throat> in addition, what motivated us was the state of our South African healthcare system. So those who are not from here um, will not know, but we have a public and a private healthcare system and the public healthcare system looks after more than 80% of the population, but has roughly only 50 to 60% of the resources. 
um, compared to the private sector. So the public health care system is, is marred by um, oversupply of uh, challenges and uh, a lack of resources. Also, Africa as a whole um, carries 24%, more than 24% of the global disease burden, yet has only access to about 3% of healthcare workers and less than 1% of financial resources. So um, the COVID epidemic certainly spelled uh, bad news for us on this continent. And very early on already in, in South Africa, um, the business sector um, realized that we would be ill-equipped to deal with this um, epidemic pandemic due to the lack of staffing, the lack of, um, for instance, uh, PPE and uh, ICU bed capacity. Now, interestingly, uh, three of the site PIs in the studies were um, primarily trained as pulmonologists and uh, um, intensivists. And maybe that spurred us on somehow, knowing that there is no way that we can increase ICU bed capacity from 3,300 to around 30,000 um, in our lifetime. Um, that would absolutely not be possible. And uh, the idea of having to turn thousands of patients away who actually need ICU care or high care was just not something we um, could stomach. Um, the modelers also suggested, uh, predicted that there would be 34 to 50,000 deaths by November of this year. And people have been laughing at them and, and said, well, look, it's, we only have 16,000 deaths now. Um, this is never going to be true. But actually, the MRC has just shown that the excess deaths in, in the country up to now in this year is 40,000. Now, there is no conceivable other reason why we would have 40,000 excess deaths, except if it is through COVID. So I think they might actually have been much closer to the truth than uh, people give them credit for. So it's really a combination of challenges that leads to this perfect storm in, in, in Africa and South Africa. Test availability was hopeless, staff shortages, conflicting messages about uh, masks and PPE, lack of water at, at peripheral clinics without which sanitation is impossible, insufficient beds, lack of PPE, disrupted logistics, import restrictions, e export restrictions for tests, etc. So we were really up against it. Also, it became clear that there wasn't going to be treatment very soon. Um, there have made, been many false starts. Um, initially promising uh, treatment modalities were very quickly um, discredited. And then we had the additional problem of uh, corruption at many fronts, including um, regarding PPE tenders. So why BCG and why revaccination? I think Christine, did an excellent job to tell us why BCG and why revaccination. So severe COVID disease is linked to dysregulated macrophage function and BCG does induce innate immune training of CD14 positive monocytes. It induces a permanent transcriptomic myeloid biases in human hematopoietic stem cells and precursor cells. Although it enhances cytokine responses in re-stimulation, it does reduce systemic inflammation. And Christine also mentioned the very good study by Escobar in PMS recently that showed that epidemiologically, uh, for every 10% increase in the BCG index, which is just an indication of BCG um, use in an area, um, there would be a, about a 10% reduction in COVID-19 mortality. Uh, Revaccination because BCG efficacy wanes in adolescents, not only as far as its effect on TB is concerned, but also as far as its non-specific effects are concerned. Why South Africa? Well, at that stage, there weren't many trials going on. The first trial was that by uh, Curtis in, the, in, in Melbourne, Australia. So they looking at mort mortality and, and severe COVID and they got $10 million from the Gates Foundation and they started more or less at the start of the peak um, 
we're not sure if they're going to um, reach their their endpoints. Although with ten thousand participants, they probably will, especially as they seem to have caught their first peak. The the study in the Netherlands um, from Utrecht and uh, Radboud University started actually at the end of their peak and is looking at absenteeism from work as a proxy for severe COVID disease. We were lucky in, in one respect that we started uh, on the 4th of May um, before our peak really um, made itself known. Um, and we were at that stage the only country looking at revaccination um, as we have a, a good BCG program for um, neonates. So the trial then, the hypothesis is that BCG revaccination will protect people at highest risk for infection, those are healthcare workers and frontline workers in hospitals like porters and cleaners uh, from severe forms of COVID-19. Um, and we were going to measure that through hospitalizations and death. The consortium is led by um, Andreas Diakon from TASC, which is a private uh, research organization, um, and also by Johnny Peters from UCT. Um, so these were two separate studies that have really combined efforts to increase the sample size. So uh, Stellenbosch University is involved from the lab side, uh, the UCT Lung Institute and CIDR at UCT are also involved, and TB Proof, a civil society uh, organization, has been incredibly supportive of the efforts and have been of huge help. Now, we also got great collaboration from the Western Cape Government Health Department and also from the City of Cape Town, the Health Department, and MediClinic South Africa. So it's an emergency trial that started on the 4th of May, double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled, single dose of BCG. Um, we um, are recruiting healthcare workers and frontline workers, uh, mainly in Cape Town, but also in George. And... Um, like I said, baseline single shot of BCG versus uh, saline placebo follow-up is for one year, and the primary endpoint is COVID-19 related hospitalization or death. Task is aiming to do 1,000 participants and have to date done 780, and UCT 500 of which about half have been enrolled. More about those numbers later. And here you see a picture of the first participant um, or at least a part of the participant, a left arm, under the watchful eye of Andreas. Now, the challenges, firstly, funding. Interestingly, there was no interest by South African funders, even after multiple appeals. And uh, I think we um, presented to them more or less all the studies that Christine referred to, uh, but were unable to sway them to fund this study. Unfortunately, also the delay in the finding, final funding decision only came um, about uh, a week, 10 days ago, well after our peak. However, the EDCDP funded a moderate amount. For the rest, both TASC, UCT, MediClinic, and Stellenbosch University self-funded this um, um, effort. We also ran into some serious resistance from some advocacy groups who um, initially wanted us to provide PPE to every participant for a full year, which is of course difficult um, as there was a lack of PPE in the country at that time. And we would not have had access to provide PPE to everyone. And also because people, the participants were working in very different environments. You know, porters need different PPE to ICU workers, etc. It was also complaint about our community engagement although we had a civil society um, partner on board already. Um, my personal opinion is that uh, this particular advocacy group was um, in need of some press. Um, also difficult was permissions to conduct research during stage five lockdown. Universities were closed and they were very risk averse. They closed down labs. We had to get special permissions to um, allow the field workers and the lab workers to come back um, to conduct the work. There was also no full staffing for clinical or lab components allowed because of social distancing 
measures that were mandatory and, and are, are, are prudent. Um, there was at that stage no free movement allowed of people, so it was difficult to, to get to the participants. They had to come really um, while they were at work, they had to come for their vaccinations and, and follow ups. In addition, the access to COVID 19 test kits was, was hopeless. The PCR kits were in high demand and it took initially 10 to 14 days to get any result so we decided not to do the pcr for this study but rely on serology the serology tests were only unbanned last week um, when um, our regulatory authority sapra uh, gave permission or authorization for a handful of point of care tests which we won't use and some elisa tests to um, look at serology we haven't decided yet on the final test we'll uh, uh, carefully look at the performance of those um, ELISA tests before we select one. It will be an IgG based test of course because we are interested in uh, infection in the last um, period before follow-up. So we are going to batch the serum samples and do the serology in a batched manner after the um, follow-up periods were done. So the concerns then were, amongst others, hospitalization assumptions, healthcare workers are actually at low risk for severe COVID, although they are at high risk for contracting infection. Uh, and that is because they are younger and don't have that many comorbidities. Um, so we were slightly concerned about that. And then of course, like Christine also said, BCG supply security was important. We know that BCG saves lives, not only through TB prevention, but also from the non-specific effects. So it's important that we don't interrupt that program. There have been supply issues. And uh, so the study made sure that it secured a trial supply of the vaccine. Now about statistics and our assumptions. Now, <clears throat> we listened to the modelers and felt that the 40% infection rate could be expected as was seen in uh, other countries like Italy, a 5% hospitalization rate and as we were hoping for a 70% effect size. Now with those figures, we would have a power of about 90% to show a difference. Um, but reality, strikes back. Our healthcare worker statistics look quite different. So currently they are, uh, last week at least, there were 27,360 confirmed infections about, amongst healthcare workers, 78% in the public sector, just over half in nurses, and 5% of all infections in healthcare workers. Now that's interesting in its own right. In the European countries, uh, healthcare workers made up about 10% of all infections. So again, why would in our situation with relatively um, poor PPE availability, only 5% only of our, um, all, all our cases would be healthcare workers. We don't understand that. 240 deaths, 75% in the public sector, case fatality rate of 0.8. Now here comes the bummer, 11.5% of national healthcare workers were infected, not 40% as we had predicted. 8% um, hospitalization rate and uh, this 11.5% um, national healthcare worker infection rate meant we can expect 173 cases of infections out of 1,500 participants and only 14 severe cases. Well, that kills the study, right? Um, if you look at this line here, um, that is for 1,750 participants, we would need about 100% efficacy to actually re reach an 80% power. So that is not going to happen. Here we have 70% uh, difference in hospitalization um, if you want to 80 to 90 percent power, you need four and a half thousand people. So that is rather disappointing. Although in Tigerberg Hospital, we're not sure yet about UCT. I don't have those figures, but at Tiger, in Tigerberg Hospital, 
we have 70% of our healthcare workers infected. So that's higher than the national average. And that may be because Tigerberg is a dedicated COVID hospital. Um, so we caught both peaks and uh, maybe there is some hope for the study, but uh, we expect to be hopelessly underpowered. So can we still learn anything from this study? Well, there have been some hard lessons that emergency research is not immune from politics. And that includes the good, the bad, and the ugly of activism, where um, uh, sit-ins and disruption of our activities were, were threatened. We were threatened with that um, if we don't uh, comply to their demands. Uh, I would have thought that emergency research um, is immune from politics, but clearly not. Um, we also saw that crises can bring competitors together. Um, that is a, a very nice feeling to have. We also saw unprecedented rapid SOPRA approvals. Western Cape government health approvals, city of Cape Town permissions and IRB approvals. Within a very, very short time, these approvals were in hand. And uh, although we don't have funding yet to, to expand the, the study, to um, deal with our um, overestimate of the number of um, infections that we would see, we still have some opportunities to investigate the biology of BCG revaccination, and we are planning single cell ATAC seek before and after revaccination to, ac to, ac to assess uh, chromatin accessibility. Um, now my screen is uh, frozen, but luckily we're at the end of my talk and I can do the last slide myself. So what next? We're still trying to get funding to increase the number from 1,500 to uh, 4,500. And we'll try our best to do that. Um, one could say that it is unethical to um, start a study without adequate funding. Well, actually we had enough funding to do 1,500. Um, is it over? Can we expect more cases? No, it's unfortunately not over. As we can see in Spain and in France and actually everywhere else, um, we will probably also not be immune from a second wave. And uh, that might also increase the number of infections that we can expect in our relatively small study. So we need the data. We still don't know, is it hope or hype? We need to increase the number of studies that do this. Maybe we can collaborate with Christine and the other um, BCG studies that are starting up, because I really believe that we're not going to have a vaccine soon. It takes a long time to develop a vaccine. I don't think ever has, have we developed a vaccine in a year. It's not going to happen now either. Treatments are not likely soon. Second waves are certainty. So we need additional funding or we need to combine studies all over the world to come up with the data. Because this is not going to be the last epidemic or the last pandemic. And the question, as Christine has also stated is can epigenetic modification hold the key to more widespread protection? Is this something that we should use to rethink vac vaccination strategies? So I want to thank the participants, the frontline heroes, who, um, although they did not always have the right PPE, went out to work and faced this foe. I want to thank the only funder, um, the EDCDP and the EU, and all the participants. At Stanford University, I want to particularly fund the lab team that during the height of lockdown was willing to come in and process samples. Um, and the same goes for the lab team at UCT, who did the same. And I think a special word of thanks should go to TV Proof and specifically Arne van Delft, who has been immensely supportive and active and uh, is really um, acting out the scientifically informed activism that I think one really needs to um, beat this foe. 
thank you for listening and I'm willing to take questions. Great, thank you very much, Gerhard. Uh, so we, we do have a, a number of questions. Uh, so the first question uh, I'm going to ask is, um, do you expect any differences from the protection of BCG revaccination among people who have already been infected with COVID-19 compared to protecting people against infection? In other words, protection against disease versus infection. So we have really no idea. Um, I think infection is unlikely to be prevented, but I think severe disease could be well. I think the whole hypothesis is, is centered around um, innate immunity training and altered um, hyper responsiveness of the innate immune system. Um, it's, so infections have an immune educational role. We see this with um, several other uh, co-infections, unrelated, unrelated co-infections, um, uh, virus upon virus, um, virus upon helminth. There are multiple uh, unrelated infections that alter the course of the second infection. They do not alter infection, the, the ability to be infected, but they alter the disease course of the second infection through immune education, through um, epigenetic changes, through altering cytokine environments, through cross-reactive immunity. So there are a range of mechanisms by which one infection can alter the course of a subsequent infection. So uh, thanks. And another question uh, is that um, I, I guess because BCG uh, leaves quite a, lot, a strong local response, how difficult will it be to actually remain double-blinded when actually BCG can actually leave a, a, a uh, distinct impression? Absolutely right. It, it won't be double-blinded. Um, we, we quickly saw that. Um, I cannot think of any way to keep that blinded <laughs> by injecting some noxious substance into the person's arm as a placebo. Uh, I think that is just not possible. We'll have to live with that one. And uh, a, a couple of questions which are kind of related, but uh, the first of which is um, obviously there's a huge HIV prevalence uh, uh, that you have to consider. Are you factoring that into your design of your vaccine trial? Uh, and and what do you anticipate uh, in those people who are HIV infected receiving BCG revaccination? So we, we excluded them for this study. As this is a really a pilot first C, I think we don't want to um, run the risk of disseminated uh, you know BCGosis. So we exclude those participants. Mm. Uh, and as a follow-up, I guess, to that is, will you be looking for other uh, infections, uh, TB being one of them, as an outcome of your study? Yeah, so TB is actually one of the secondary endpoints. I think in all realistic terms, 1,500 participants, we're not going to find in one year too many um, people who progress. Um, maybe 1% to 2% in healthcare workers. Um, it's unlikely that we'll be able to see a difference between the groups. Um, we're not looking at other infections. We're not taking swabs, for instance, nasopharyngeal swabs. And it would be difficult to, to capture those infections, right? I mean, if somebody gets hospitalized, presumably they will undergo a full infectious screen and we might be able to uh, make sense of that. But the study is not really designed to uh, capture other infections as well. So, so you, you mentioned uh, another question here. You mentioned um, HIV is an exclusion criteria. What else, uh, cardiovascular to be disease, diabetes, etc. What what else are excluded in your study design? Yeah, well, any severe systemic um, disorder. I mean. In our healthcare workers, we don't really expect that, right? It is a pretty strenuous job to be a nurse or a porter or a security guard. So we don't actually see many other severe comorbidities. We do see a lot of type two diabetes though, and that could become interesting. Um, but other than that, 
uh, cardiac, severe cardiac disease, etc., was was all excluded. And in, in your uh, trial so far, what what type of adverse events have you seen? Have you can you divulge any of that information? Almost exclusively local local um, reactions to the BCG vaccine, or maybe it's to the saline vac vaccine placebo. We don't know. Right, right, right. Okay. So uh, another question here is, I'll read it because uh, I'm not sure if it's, it, yeah. I'll, what are the implications of your learnings thus far from your study of other phase two, three COVID vaccine trials in South Africa, especially here in the Western Cape? Uh, for example, the Oxford Chadox trial, Novavax, which has just started. What, what, what do you kind of take home from those trials or learning experiences? Oh, wasn't it quite unexpected that BCG revaccination would decrease the um, incidence of uh, persistent infection by 45%? I mean, that, mm. um, although it's related to deep TB, directly to deep TB, for me, certainly that was quite unexpected. Um, so I do think that uh, BCG revaccination needs a thorough second look and uh, not only for TB, but also for other conditions. Mm. And another, another question um, on the chat, uh, which Christine has answered in the uh, chat question answer box, but I'll put to you, is uh, what are your thoughts on controlled human infection studies for assessing COVID vaccine, including BCG? Yeah, um, controlled human infection studies, well, there is always this uh, ethical dilemma. You cannot, with certainty, guarantee that um, a person is not going to come to serious harm. Um, unfortunately, severe COVID disease does not only happen in the elderly and those with comorbidities. There seem to be some uh, TLR um, factors that... Uh, can predispose even young people to uh, severe and even fatal COVID infection. I think we have enough COVID infection going around that we don't have to resort to, to such, I think, relati relatively extreme measures. I think it's different for TB, where um, we are able to control the infection with antibiotics very swiftly. Um, and certainly, oxytroph uh, TB strains might be a way to go. Uh, BCG challenges as a proxy for, for, for TB. Um, those have been explored by Helen McShane and others. Uh, Kirtan, I think, is doing some of that work as well. Um, but I think for COVID, we have enough natural infection. Why go and put the participant's life at risk, even if it's a small risk? Um, we're still looking at a 0.8% uh, mortality. Um, I personally would not want to be involved in such a study. Okay, another question um, is um, the epigenetic changes that you see with, with BCG can potentially last for quite a while. Uh, what would the effect you think of having BCG and then someone receiving a, a, a direct COVID-19 vaccine be? I don't think that it would, we don't know, but I don't think there has to be an adverse um, or a decreased response to the direct COVID vaccine. Um, <clears throat> I think administering the, the vaccine would probably still allow, like, like we said, it won't affect infection. It will probably infect the course of disease. So I would think that there would still be a chance for the adaptive immune system to um, be primed by the COVID vaccine and to uh, generate specific COVID um, adaptive immunity. Um, I think it's more the course of disease through the immune modulation um, and the effects on the macrophages that um, lead to uh, um, hyperinflammation that could be altered by the BCG vaccine. I do not think that BCG um, vaccination will preclude a subsequent um, COVID-specific vaccine. 
Okay, uh, and, and I think the, the, the last question, which is um, funding, is, is why is this been difficult to get funders? Uh, you may have covered this a little bit, but, but what is the impediment, do you think? What's the challenge here when, when uh, it's a known vaccine, it's being given? And... Yeah, so, so the South African funders have a couple of problems. The one is they don't have, fun, they don't have money. The economy was in ruins before this started. Um, that is, is definitely playing into it. Um, and actually the scientific community was uh, canvassed by the funder about whether this should be um, supported. And uh, um, they got a emphatic thumbs down. Um, I'm not sure. Um, uh, it, it appears that the secondary effects, the non-specific effects of BCG are not generally accepted, um, certainly not in our scientific community, um, as they have in, for instance, the, the, um, the Netherlands. Um, maybe it's because uh, Mihai Netea is a very, very prominent researcher working on this in the Netherlands. Um, and. Uh, that he has uh, the support of their funding agencies. Um, I think for the Gates Foundation, the issue was they had already funded such a study in Australia. So they were not going to fund another smaller study in uh, South Africa. They had already spent $10 million on a study in Australia. Why would they pull out another 10 million for a study in South Africa? Um, the EDCDP didn't have a lot of funding available, but they they did fund this this study. Um, South Africans don't have too many funding organisations. We have the NRF, we have the MRC, and that's it. Um, and and many of the other funders really didn't have COVID in on their radar immediately, and all had very specific calls that um, targeted either a COVID specific vaccine or treatment modality, but uh, we're not interested in secondary effects of um, BCG. I think everybody put their money on a, a breakthrough new antiviral therapy or immune modulator or a, a COVID specific vaccine. Um, so this was slightly off their radar, I think. But I do strongly feel that this needs further exploration because it could be um, a factor in future epidemics. We don't want to go through the same thing again and again. A new disease, no treatment, no vaccine. How long is it going to be for Putin and Trump to come up with their vaccines? Um, we need to clear this up. Does BCG actually protect not specifically sufficiently or not. If this study, if these studies turn out to be negative, good, then at least we know. We can stop wasting our time. But we need to know. We need to put the data on the board. Great. I, I think with that, uh, Gerhard, thank you very much indeed. We'll end there. Um, and thank you very much to the audience. I just want to put a, a notice up for our next uh, uh, webinar, which is uh, in two weeks from now. Um, and that is going to be by uh, Professor Johnny Peter on immune modulation as therapy for COVID-19, steroids and newer agents, and Dr. Melinda Suchard, uh, the president of the South African Immunology Society on macrophage activation and nicotinamide pathways in COVID-19. Thank you very much for attending today's webinar and thank you very much, Christy and Gerhard, for your fantastic contributions to this uh, webinar today. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you and goodbye.